Welcome, precious saints, to this edition of Pauline Lectures, uh, your weekly dose of edification. You know the drill. Pass on that link, invite someone, and tell them the favorite Bible program of the week has just started. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to share, receive, learn, and be edified from your word as we study from the book of First Corinthians. We receive light today. We receive understanding and we receive edification. You are glorified in all this. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have been doing a, a series in the book of First Corinthians, which we have called Lessons from Corinth. And uh, we have been going through the book chapter by chapter and verse by verse and are picking some of those lessons, some of those questions that may be even present in our present day Christian work. I have said and I do maintain that the, Christ, the Christian walk is a walk of knowledge. It's one where really, if you don't have knowledge, you cannot walk this walk the best way that God intended you to walk it. So last week, we handled a, uh, an important subject in chapter 11 uh, concerning gathering together, Holy Communion. So you will do well to just go back and look through that and find some of the answers to those questions that you may have. Today, we are in chapter 12. I, I, some of you know from the beginning, I told you I could not wait to get to chapter 12. Chapter 12, uh, spiritual gifts, and chapter 14, tongues, and so on and so forth. And I believe today we are going to be very, very, very edified. Find somewhere to scribble, find a notebook, have your Bible ready with you, and let us get ready to study. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. Paul writes, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man, speaking by the Spirit of God, calls Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. So he starts from verse 1 and says, now concerning, concerning. That word concerning in the Greek is peri, peri, P-E-R-I. Peri uh, is now coming. This is the subject matter. Now, if you've been following, you find that the book of Corinthians is uh, chapterized in such a way that almost each chapter deals with something different. So now when it says now concerning, concerning. Remember, we have also seen that this letter was a letter Paul wrote also in response, in response to some of the questions, but also in response to some of the reports he was getting coming from Corinth. Uh, like uh, in chapter 7, verse 1, he says uh, concerning, you know, a touching of a woman. Uh, some people asked him uh, issues concerning, you know, uh, sex and sexual morality and marriage and so on and so forth. So it was a direct answer. Then uh, uh, issues of division, he says, I have had that divisions among you, and we saw that uh, in chapter 11, and he says, and I believe it to be true. So you have a mixture of reports coming from there, but also questions coming from Corinth to which he responded in this epistle to the, first, uh, to the Corinthians, his first epistle. So now he says, now concerning spiritual gifts okay so now what is the subject at hand the subject at hand is spiritual gifts if you look at that chapter 12 verse 1 very carefully you find that the word gifts is italicized okay and we have said that when a word is italicized it means that it wasn't there in the originals but uh, perhaps the translators just added it there you know uh, for comprehension or to for this for uh, sometimes for the sentence to make grammatical sense. So when you see that word gifts, it was added. However, when you go through chapter 12 quite well, the discussion is on gifts. So that imputation by the translators uh, does not add any significant uh, theological difference. So we can take that now concerning spiritual gifts. Amen. Then he says, I would not have you be ignorant. I would not have you be ignorant. Let me first deal with the word spiritual briefly. We're going to come back to it. The word spiritual is the Greek word pneumatikos. Pneumatikos. P-N-E 
U M A T I K O S. Numaticos. Now, numaticos implies of the spirit, by the spirit, or in the spirit. So, uh, numaticos. You have these prepositions that can go with spiritual, spiritual, okay, pneumaticos. For instance, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we read, uh, uh, so let me just go through that and I'll just show you. Um, verse 11, for what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of a man in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. He says, we have not received the spirit of the world, but received the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given unto us. Okay? Which things, verse 13, also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. This is the best example. So you have pneumaticos, pneumaticos, but the first, uh, the first spiritual there deals like we handled when we are here it deals with spiritual information and then the second one deals with the people so you have the people and the information in chapter 3 verse 1 paul says i could not speak unto you as spiritual but as unto carnal even as unto babes okay so spiritual again they are referring to people then in chapter 10 it speaks of a spiritual rock which followed them and also uh, speaks about that water, which, you know, they, they drank of uh, in verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, and they all drank this of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. If you get this text in chapter 10, verse 4, uh, you discover that he's talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness with Moses where Moses would get water from them from the rock. Now, Paul tells us that that rock followed them, and that rock is Christ. Now, let me say something a little bit here, because I know I didn't handle it in chapter 10. Let's just go there, chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers uh, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Okay? Uh, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So, the way uh, the King James writes here in chapter 10, you would think they actually drank of the rock. You would think they actually drank of that spiritual rock. So you would think they believed in Christ, but not so. Because in Hebrews chapter 4, this is the children of Israel, you know them, that generation which was under Moses, you know from history in Exodus and Numbers, only Joshua and Caleb and the younger, the younger who are 20 years and younger, were able to go through and go into the promised land. The rest of them died in the wilderness. Now, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, the writer of Hebrews writes this. He says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should come, should seem to come short of it. For unto us the gospel was preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as I said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So what do we see? We see that the same gospel preached to us was also preached to them, but that they did not mix it with faith. In other words, they did not receive it with faith. So in First Corinthians, Paul uses the type of the rock as that rock being Christ, who followed them. That water, it's the water of Christ they were supposed to take up, that is to believe in him. But if you've read Numbers, if you've read Exodus, you know that they actually murmured and disobeyed. So, 
1 Corinthians chapter 10 is like a rhetorical question. They did not drink, but they were meant to drink of that spiritual rock. They were meant to drink of that water, that water and that rock which is Christ, but they did not. And that is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, he says God was not pleased with them. Hebrews eleven six. what is the pleasure of God? Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In Hebrews chapter 4, from what we just read, they did not believe. They did not mix it with faith. So that generation did not have faith. They did not believe. Thus, they did not partake of the rock that followed them, which was Christ. So Paul now writes in verse 6 and says, Now these things... Uh, where our examples, the Greek word there is tupos, T-U-P-O-S. It means it is a type that we should not last after evil things as they did last after. Hallelujah. Why did we come here? It was not part of what I was meant to share. We came here because we're looking at spiritual rock, spiritual rock. So the spiritual rock there, who is Christ, is referring to the gospel if you collaborate it with Hebrews chapter 4. Hallelujah. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So the word spiritual, pneumatikos, means of the spirit. Of the spirit. Can be man, can be information. Okay? Can be man, can be information. Or, in this case, in chapter 12, is gifts. Amen. I know we are together. Okay? So now he says, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, brethren, I would, I would not have you ignorant. In other words, I don't want you to be ignorant. This implies it's very possible to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. The word ignorant is agnohio. In the Greek, A G N O E O, agnoio. Agnoio means a willful ignorance. It's a refusal to recognize. Okay? It's to be in the dark, a refusal to recognize, a willful ignorance. It's, just, it's not just really an ignorance, but as you're going to find out uh, at Corinth, it is a refusal to know. It's a willful ignorance. Now, one thing you must know, that the church at Corinth was not absent expressions, operations, demonstrations of the Spirit. They were happening. However, Paul is telling them, I don't want you to be ignorant. He's indirectly saying, you are ignorant. He's not saying you have not seen, but he's saying you are ignorant, and I don't want you to be ignorant. Look at uh, chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. He says that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, the church at Corinth came behind in no gift. They came behind in no gift. So, the fact that a man is indwelt by the Spirit, or he demonstrates the diversities of the gifts and the administrations which are in the Spirit, does not mean that he's not ignorant of the things of the Spirit. Many of us spoke in tongues. Let me even speak for myself. I spoke in tongues before I knew what they were about, what it does, what they mean. Some of us think we speak in tongues so that the devil doesn't hear what we are going to say. But is that why tongues are given? So you can operate a gift but not know or be ignorant about the operations of that gift. And that is the case here at Corinth. So what does it do? How do you cure spiritual ignorance? 
You cure spiritual ignorance by teaching. So in chapter 12, he says, I would have you know, or verse 3, wherefore I give you to understand. I give you to understand. Next week we'll handle chapter 14, God willing. So you're going to see that he's going to paint out an understanding of spiritual gifts. And I believe as we go through what Paul wrote, you and I are going to be blessed today and we're going to be edified in the same. We're going to have a better understanding of these gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16, he was speaking about that, you know, uh, when you shall bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen? This is speaking about tongues. So, when you are speaking in tongues, in the assembly, there is one person is calling the unlearned. The unlearned. The unlearned cannot say amen. So, there can be people in our midst, in our congregation, that are unlearned when it comes to the things of the Spirit. Particularly here in chapter 14, what you'll have in discussion is tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. In verse 23, he says, If therefore the whole church be come together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, or unbelievers. So you have unbelievers, and you have unlearned Christians. And sometimes unlearned Christians will act as unbelievers, sorry to say. Will, will they not say you are mad? I think many of us have a testimony where we have referred to gifts of the Spirit in operation with, among us believers as madness. I'll give you an example. Maybe you have seen some people laughing in the Holy Ghost and they have said, these guys are crazy. These guys are mad. You are unlearned. You say, what is joy? What is, they are laughing like they are mad people. No, it's just because you are occupying the room of the unlearned. I know sometimes people say a miracle happened and they attribute it to some other power, some other force. Why? Because usually we are unlearned. So we don't know what happens by the Spirit or happens in the Spirit. And that can also work counter. Sometimes something is an act of the flesh and we refer to it as being of the Spirit. Again, why? Because we are unlearned. So, someone can call fellow believers mad. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and 25. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believes not, or one that is unlearned. Okay. He is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and verse 25, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. So, this person comes into a meeting, you speak in tongues, you prophesy, you tell him about his life, and he falls down and worships God. The spectacular, the spectacular, he, he's, he's marveled by the spectacular. Amen. And sometimes that speaks about our maturity. Okay? So, what happens? The essence of this understanding communicated by Paul was for them to be effective and edify one another when they come together. Now, let me say this, and you can note it down. A practice and an experience of the things of the Spirit does not equal to edification. Edification is only achieved where there is understanding. What do I mean? You cannot build other believers by the things of the Spirit without an understanding of the same. You know, sometimes when it comes to spiritual things, we think spiritual things are spooky. We think spiritual things are those things that have no explanation. Paul begs to differ. In fact, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Many of us think when it comes to the things of the Spirit, that is what happens when the Spirit takes over. You know, you have no control of your mouth, you have no control of 
like the spirit has taken over not really not really again as we look at chapter 14 uh we'll handle some of those aspects so there is what i call spiritual intelligence spiritual intelligence you know it's very dangerous to be exposed to the things of the spirit without knowledge especially things that have to do with revelations, with visions. See, whatever you see by the Spirit, you will have to interpret from what you know. Spiritual information is received, but is decoded, and the template or the key or the roadmap to decoding spiritual information is an understanding of the things of the Spirit as explained in the Scriptures. Otherwise, you can get things wrong and you can hurt many people, including yourself. Amen. Let me just leave it at that so that I don't be uh, distracted. Now we're going to the interesting part. Verse 4. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 12, now, let me just back up a little bit in verse 3. It says, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. You cannot say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's not just speaking. I, I believe you have more of a homology here. You have, you have a joint confession within what is in the heart and what is in the mouth, an acknowledgement of the Lordship of Jesus Christ can only happen by the Spirit of God, which implies every man's first encounter with the Spirit is at salvation. It takes the Spirit of God to say yes to Jesus. Okay? It's at that salvation that the Spirit of God becomes the Spirit of a man or becomes the Spirit in a man. Amen. So you cannot say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. So because you have said Jesus is Lord, that means you're born again. You have accepted the Lord in his work of salvation, death, and resurrection. It implies that you have a witness of the Spirit. The, wit the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm getting excited now. Let me just calm down. So, in verse 4, he now says, Now there are diversities of, of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Verse 4, the word diversities is diaresis. Diaresis, which is D I A I. R-E-S-I-S. D-I-A-I-R-E-S-I-S. -S. Diaresis. Now, it implies varieties. When you're dealing with diaresis, listen to me very well, it means a part of a whole. You're dealing with a part of a whole. Okay? So, when he says there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. He says the, the different gifts are part of the spirit. All the spirit is a whole, and the gifts are part. Amen. So, where you have the spirit, you have the diversities. Where you have the spirit, you have the gifts. That's what Paul is saying here. That word gifts is a Greek word charisma. Now one thing you must know about the Greek language or the Bible, let me just not assume. The Bible, 66 books, uh, subdivided into what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament originally written in Hebrew the New Testament originally written in Greek. Okay? 
So when we say the Greek word there, we're going back to the original, not to sound smart, but sometimes when they were translating from, say, Greek to English, the English language did not have the exact word, did not have the exact word. So the translators would put a word they felt would fit what the author was talking about. So in doing that, they were translating from an understanding as well. Okay, so when we go back to original words, we're trying to find the best meaning of a word or the, from the original word to find out what the original author intended to pass along. Now, when you're studying the Greek, these words did not come in plural. So when they're translated into the English, the word now becomes gifts. It takes on a plural. Now, why would he say gifts? He says gifts because if you go into the discussion, you're going to discover he's going to be talking about more than one. However, the word from the Greek is not a plural. So the word for gifts in the Greek is charisma. Charisma. C-H-A-R-I-S-M-A from charis, where you have grace, charis, to give freely. Now, charisma refers to an endowment, an endowment. An endowment uh, means that when you have this thing, it is yours. It's like you say you're endowed. When you have this thing, it is yours. So charisma speaks of an endowment. Amen. Uh, used in chapter uh, in that same chapter, we we'll have it in verse four. The word charisma or gifts, verse nine, verse twenty-eight, verse thirty, and verse thirty-one. So charisma are supernatural faculties. Okay, they are because I said it's an endowment. An endowment is like an ability that comes with birth. It comes with birth. It's not something you earn. At birth, you have it. So, the charisma or pneumaticus charisma, the, chari uh, the spiritual endowments, would be things we partake or become a part of us at our spiritual birth. So, at spiritual birth, you are endowed. Or at spiritual birth, you have the charisma. At spiritual birth, you have the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. So, now when they're in the position, when, the, when they're in your position because you're endowed with, then it, 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 uh, it, it becomes up to you for their stewardship. That English doesn't sound right. Or... The charisma is within your stewardship. So you steward what you've been endowed with. Amen. It is possible for a man to have this endowment and this charisma and they do not know. That's why Paul said, I would not have you ignorant. When we come to tongues, we're going to even discover and we say, wow. You mean I had this all along? Yes. Yes. So let's continue. So the diversities come from the Holy Ghost. There are differences of administration, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. So that word diresis is the same word used for differences. In verse 5, and diversities in verse 6. Please note that. Okay? Diresis. Diresis. Diversities in verse 4. Differences in verse 5. Um, diversities in verse 6. So, parts of the whole. The operations, the administrations, and the gifts are all in the spirit. So, they are 
There are many endowments in the spirit. That spirit is indwelling the believer. Okay? All these endowments, all these diversities, all these operations are in the spirit, which also implies they are in the believer. That's why he says it's the same Lord, the same God. If it's a gift, it's by that spirit. If it's the operation, it's by that Lord, who is also the spirit. If it's the administration, it's also from him. And that's why we have verse 7. Say that the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Same spirit, same Lord, same God. Charisma. Charisma is in the charisma is given freely. Charis by grace. In the spirit, the spirit which no one can say that Jesus is Lord without. So that spirit is in the believer along with the charisma. So the operations, um, the administration, and the gifts are in the spirit. In the believer. So when he says the manifestation, phanerosis, phanerosis, P H A, phanerosis is the word manifestation there, P H A N E R O S I S. Phanerosis implies the unveiling, it is a full disclosure. Phanerosis is not gradual, it is full, it is complete. It means to be emptied without holding nothing back. Amen. So, the emptying of the Spirit without holding nothing back is given to every man to profit with all. Who is the every man? The every man is that one according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. He that has received the Spirit of God that he may know the things which are freely given him. Who is every man? 3.16, 1 Corinthians 3.16. That one who is the temple of God, in whom the spirit of God dwells. Who is the every man? That one in 6.17. The one who is joined to the Lord and is one spirit with him. Who is every man? That one in 6.19 and 20. The one who is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay, the one whose body is bought at the price. That is the man who is every man. That one in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. That one by one spirit who is baptized into that one body. That one who has been made to drink into that one spirit. To drink into that same spirit. So the full disclosure. Everything there is in the spirit is emptied in you and me who has believed the gospel. That is why we have every operation, we have every administration, we have every gift. Why? Because it is pneumaticos, spiritual. It's a gift in the spirit. Do you now see that? It's not a, just a gift of the spirit, it is a gift in the spirit. So what do I check? Am I in the spirit? How am I in the spirit? Is it when I fast? Is it a place I go to? No. Because the spirit of God is living on us. Let me just jump that Romans 8. It's not on the script. But let me just read that. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Amen. Okay, verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But you have Christ. Are you goddess? If you are goddess, you have the spirit of Christ. Then you are not in the flesh. Okay. Then, um, let me jump and I read verse uh, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So you have a joint witness with the spirit of God that you are children of God, that you are Godies, like Pastor Ronald will say. You are Godies. You are of God. You have the spirit of God. You have the spirit of God. You have the charisma in the spirit. If you have the charisma in the spirit, you have the phanerosis of the spirit. You have the full disclosure of the spirit. So, the full disclosure of the spirit. Everything about the spirit is emptied in you to profit with all. Back and back in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. To profit with all. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse uh, six, 7. That word profit with all is the word sumfero. Sumfero. S-U-M-P-H-E-R-O. S-U-M-P-H-E-R-O. It means to bear together, to contribute, to supply. The essence of these gifts in the spirit are to supply, are to contribute. The fullest disclosure of the spirit in you is to contribute, is to supply. Remember our teaching from last week about the body of Christ? To supply. Amen. So it's not given to you to make you more superior to others. It's not given unto you to make you shine. It's not given unto you to feel like you're the head of the world. No. It's given unto you to supply. It's given unto you to edify. Amen. Other believers. I have the spirit of God. I have the fullness of the spirit of God. You know, you can repeat those words. I have the fullest disclosure of everything. I have everything that is in the spirit. All the gifts. All the operations, all the manifestations to profit others. Amen. So, all diversities of the gifts in the spirit are abilities to every believer. Yes, yes, they are abilities to every believer. So what are these diversities? First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Amen. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophet, prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another Diverse kinds of tongues. The word diverse there is italicized. So what you have uh, should read as to another kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. Verse 11. But all these worketh the one and the self same spirit. Dividing to every man severally as he will. Now. Paul will now list, uh, will now list the diversities. He mentions nine different gifts of the spirit. These nine different uh, gifts of the Spirit have been characterized by men of God who have gone before, like Howard Carter and Brother Hagin, into three subcategories. Nine gifts of the Spirit in three subcategories. The first category is utterance gifts. We call them utterance gifts. Under utterance gifts, you have the gifts of tongues, or the kinds of tongues that uh, uh, in verse 10, you have interpretation of tongues and prophecy. Utterance gifts, you have tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. Now, utterance gifts are vocal gifts. They are vocal gifts. Or they are gifts that say something. And usually, these three work together. Actually, more often than not, they work together. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. The second category in there is revelation gifts. Under revelation gifts, you have word of wisdom, word of knowledge, 
and the sign of spirits. Okay? These revelation gifts, they show something. They are informative. They disclose something. Okay? Now, word of knowledge discloses facts or events of the present or the past. The gift of the word of knowledge of the present or the past. Then, word of wisdom is more futuristic. Word of wisdom is futuristic. Now, notice discerning of spirits is not saying discerning of evil spirits. So sometimes we think discerning of spirits means to discern evil spirits. Now, discerning of spirits is the ability to see, hear, perceive, and recognize spiritual personalities or say that again. It's the ability to see, hear, perceive, or recognize spiritual personalities or events. The third category we can get from those nine gifts of the spirit is what Brother Hagen and Art Carter called the power gifts. The power gifts. The power gifts you have, the gifts of faith, gifts of what is miracles, and the gifts of healing. Faith, gift of faith, wonders of miracles, and gifts of miracles. Healing. These deal with nature or natural things. And they alter, restore, or create in nature. They alter, restore, or create in nature. If I could give you maybe an Old Testament example. For Joshua to make the stand, the sun stand still, that's in the power gifts. Uh, creative miracles are in power gifts. You know, a tumor falls off somebody's body. Those are power gifts. Miracles, a leg grows out. Those are in the part of power gifts, which is why there's of miracles. Or uh, if somebody has a cancer and it falls out, that is gifts of healing. Power gifts. These are the most spectacular ones, which most polite, especially the unbelievers. But all these gifts are in the now it's a given, yes it's true, some people operate in some dimensions of these gifts more than others, which we will discuss in the future. Now, when we go back to that verse 10, 1 Corinthians, I told you that word diverse, when you see diverse kinds of tongues, the word diverse is not in the written and was added by the translator. Now why is this important? Especially when we're going to deal with tongues. Some people say that tongues actually means that you're speaking in another person's language somewhere in the world. And it's just the gift of tongues. Now, what we have there as kinds of tongues is genus glossa. Genus glossa. Kinds is the Greek word genus. G E N O S. Genus, uh, like where, where you have G. It speaks of family, tribe, nation, kindred, heritage. This is something unique to a tribe, something unique to a nation. So, in essence, the tongues, that tongues separate this nation. They, dis they, they distinguish this nation. Now, then glossa refers to a language. What tongues are glossa refers to a language. It's not, it does not have to be a language that is naturally learned or acquired. So when you say genus glossa, he is trying to distinguish these tongues from all tongues. Now, all the tongues of men. They say all the languages, all the tribes in the earth, that is a kind. Then there is a spiritual language because it's a spiritual nation. Remember the word spiritual? Of the spirit, born from the spirit of God. So in this nation of the spirit of God, there is a language. It's a language and it can be spoken by someone in Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, Europe, or America, and they all come from that one nation. 
So that tongue distinguishes that nation, the nation of God. Hallelujah. So it's not to be uh, a mistaken to mean the different uh, languages, the different uh, language that if they may be I'm from Uganda and by the gifts of tongues I can speak in Japanese and that's all that is. Verse 11. First Corinthians 2 of 11. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now remember, they are the gifts of the Spirit, but they are varieties. Most varieties were discussed from verse 8 to 10. Okay? So, he, if the discussion is on gifts, in verse 11, he cannot be talking about individual because you can read verse 11 to me brother so and so has tongues I have interpretation somebody has workings of miracles another person has gifts of faith the spirit you know divides as he will that's not what this verse means let's just break it apart now let me just take you a little bit back Remember, in verse 7, we say the full disclosure of the Spirit. Okay? Or oh, the fullness of the Spirit poured out, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone who has the Spirit to benefit, to contribute, to edify, to profit. Okay? Then he starts to describe those diversities those operations and he lists nine so the nine are in the manifestation not so the nine are in the full disclosure so that is what is described then he says in verse 11 all these it's the same spirit that causes them to be effect that works them, that gives them Okay, and the distribution there, the dividing, is there's something I missed. I wanted to say. When you see the word another, to another, to another, to another, to another, that word in the Greek is alos, a double l o s. Alos in the Greek means same. Okay. Now, let me just try to, so, one spirit, verse 8, gives word of wisdom. Now, we're going to replace another with a loss, which is the same, or also. Also, word of wisdom, also faith, also gifts of healing, also what is of miracles? So, all those things are in that spirit. All those things are by that spirit. All those things come from that spirit. But they are different parts of the spirit. That is the word diversity. So, the, the dividing is the diversity. So, that is the diversity. But it is in every man. Okay? Now, the word worketh is energy or means active. Okay? Active. So, those things are active in every believer as he will. Now, the word he will, he will, we have assumed it means as the Spirit is willing. If the Spirit is willing, I'll speak in tongues. If the Spirit is willing, I'll prophesy. If the Spirit is willing, A, B, C, D. But that word he will comes from the Greek word bulomai. Bulomai, B O U L O M A I. B O U L O M A I. Bulomai means to desire. Okay? 
Now, how does the spirit will? Let's come from the winning of the spirit. Can the spirit be resident in you? Can the spirit bring the fullness of what is in the spirit in you and not be willing? I think that is willing enough, if you ask me. The fact that the spirit is in me, staying in me not to leave, but he has also come with all his gifts, all his charisma, all his endowments, that is him willing. Now, who now desires? The one that desires is the one who is going to profit. The one that desires is the one who is going to edify. The one that desires is the one who is going to distribute to others, and that is you. Okay? So, they come severally when you desire, at your desire. Amen. Hallelujah. So, now, from verse 12 up to verse 27, he now brings in an analogy of the physical body. He's going to use the physical body working together as an allegory of the gifts of the spirit in the spirit. Okay? So, he's going to teach the functioning of the spiritual body. And when you read there, I'm not going to read everything there. When you read there, you're going to discover that it is not a body without those different individual parts working together. And one of the things he highlighted so significantly in those verses is that all those parts are significant. Let me just read a few verses. Um, verse 24. He says, For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer or the members suffer with it, or one member be honored or members rejoice with it. Okay? Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Okay, now stay with me. Remember, the discussion is gifts in the spirit. They come gifts. So, we've just seen in verse 11, he's not talking about individuals but gifts. Then, he's going to bring the analogy of the physical body and call the different parts of the body members. He's going to address them as individuals. Imagine, Imagine now said um, God gave, let's, let's use this analogy. Imagine you say God gave some people an arm, some people a leg, some, some individuals only have an eye. You see how it doesn't make sense? Now, look at the different gifts, the different gifts, the different varieties. varieties. Look at those different gifts as different body parts. Okay? It's when they are together in the spirit that it is a body. Or it's when they are together in the spirit that they are the gifts of that spirit. So he's not saying God gives some individual prophecy. That would mean that some bodies, I mean like some humans are only an arm. Some humans are only a leg. Some humans are only an eye, which is not true. And I think he wrote that. Okay? The, body, the whole body is not a foot. Verse, uh, let me start from 14. Um, for the body is not one member, but many. If, if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not the body. Is it therefore not the body? If the ear shall say, I'm not the eye, I'm not the body. Is it therefore not the body? No. If the whole body were an eye, where, where, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would, this, where would the smelling be? You see? So, everything is not prophecy in the spirit. Everything is not workings of miracle. Everything is not healings. Everything is not discerning of spirits. Are, you, are we understanding each other? Amen. So, he's not talking about a distinction that disqualifies you from, from some varieties of the spirit. No. Rather, 
is explaining the working of these different varieties in the same spirit. Hallelujah. Let's go to verse 28. You know, actually, I tried to Google today. I tried to Google uh, body parts that people think are not important. But I'll, I'll not bore you with the science. But there, <laughs> there are some body parts that sometimes people think are not important. Maybe what you mean, uh, uh, what may come to mind first for some people in basic maybe medicine or science is an appendix. But an appendix also has a function. So sometimes, you know, you may think that some body parts are not important, some gifts are not important, some things are not for us, not really. Everything is in the spirit, everything is important, everything is given to profit. That's why that diversity is there. So who wills? You will. You will. You desire. Verse 28, and God has set some in the church. Now, I want everyone here to be awake. We're going to start another thing just so let's just be attentive now. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, second the prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. Uh -huh. That's are all apostles? Are all prophets? You know? Do, does everyone have gifts of healing? Even Paul said it. Some people don't have gifts of healing. No. Not really. One of the first things you notice there is that the words are, A-R-E, was not in the originals. In verse 29. So you have all apostles, all prophets, all teachers, all workers of miracles. We're going to come to the significance of that in a moment. But in verse 28, you have apostles, prophets, teachers. Those first three are what we call ministry gifts. Ministry gifts. And we're going to look at them uh, today in Ephesians chapter 4. Ministry gifts. So that's a, a, a classification. It's not the Bible which called them ministry gifts. But again, some people went ahead and studied, classified them like you saw power gifts, uh, uh, utterance gifts, and revelation gifts as ministry gifts. Ministry gifts is where you have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. Okay. Then from there, what do you have? You have miracles, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Miracles, then gifts of healing. That's another classification. Miracles and gifts of healing came earlier in verse 9 and 10. Remember? Workings of miracles, gifts of healing, they are under power gifts, if you remember very well. So they have spoken of. Then you have uh, helps and government and diverse kinds of tongues. Diverse, diversities of tongues. Now you see, this is why you go to the original language. The word diversities we have been looking at before dealt with a part of a whole, right? It was a word, diaresis. Now, here, and, and I think this is, this is like the translator's bias. Because in verse 10, he has used the word diverse. In verse 28, he now chooses to use diversities even if the Greek words are different. Okay? The word diversity is actually is the word genos. So actually, here should also be kinds of tongues. Remember, genos means was what used for kinds in verse 10. So instead of diversities of tongues, we have kinds of tongues or the tongues which are uh, described earlier in verse 10. What am I saying? I hope I'm not too fast. What am I saying? In verse 28, you find the ministry gifts, apostles, prophets, teachers. That's a classification. You're going to find workings of miracles, gifts of healing. They have been discussed earlier, verse 9 and 10. 
then you are going to have tongues, which have also been mentioned earlier. But then you have helps governments. What are those? Helps and governments. These ones were not repeated anywhere by Paul. Amen. Some people say there is a gift of helps. I, I thought I thought about I, I subscribed to that uh, kind of understanding before, and I thought people were in ushering, parking, security. Those are helps. Maybe church administrators. Those are gifts of uh, government. I would say some people are gifted to usher. Some people are gifted to 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 do administrative work in the church. But no, this is not what is discussing. The words in the Greek are antilepsis and kubanesis. Helps is from the Greek word antilepsis. A-N-T-I-L-E-P-S-I-S. Antilepsis. And then government is kubanesis. K-U-B-E-R-N-E-S-I-S. Antilepsis means to help, to aid. And kubernesis means give direction. So, antilepsis and kubernesis helps and government mean to help and give direction to. Help and give direction to what? If you read in context there, help and give um, direction comes next to diversities of tongues. So, it is to help and give direction to tongues. The spiritual gifts that are to help and give direction to tongues is the gift of interpretation of tongues. Amen. So, you can say helps and government there, actually, in the earlier classification, will deal with the gift of interpretation of tongues. Interpretation of tongues helps to govern and direct the gift of tongues in the church and the outcome there is prophecy. All of which we'll see when we're looking at chapter 14. Amen. Now verse 29. Remember I told you are all apostles is actually all apostles, all prophets. Now, R is not in the original. The Greek, I'm going to read some Greek for you. Don't fear. The Greek uh, in the interline actually reads like this. Mepantes apostolos or mepantes charismata in verse 30. That means not all apostles. Mepantes apostolos. Not all apostles or mepantes charismata not all gifts or have all gifts in verse 30. What does it mean? What he actually means is this. What is the all? The gifts. Not all the gifts are apostles. Amen. Not all the gifts are healing. The discussion is on gifts. Remember, you're discussing the all. He has used the analogy of the body. In verse 14, the body is not one member but many. Verse 4 and 5, diversities in the same body, diversities of gifts, of ministries, and administrations. Now, in those gifts, not all those gifts are apostles. In those gifts, not all gifts are healing. In those gifts, not all gifts are tongues. In those gifts, not all gifts are interpretation of tongues. So Paul is not discussing individuals, but he is discussing individual gifts. The parable of the whole body is not talking about the church, different members of the church, no. Different gifts in the spirit. Hallelujah. So, if you've been disqualifying yourself, no, come out. Don't disqualify yourself. 
All those are endowments. Remember, endowments, charisma, what you receive at birth, at spiritual birth. I have the spirit and the what? And the phanerosis, the fullness, the fullest disclosure, the manifestation of the spirit. So I say, mm, I don't believe you. This is why in verse 31 he says this. Covet honestly the best gifts. Do you see that? This is why you covet the gifts, not the individual. Because the discussion is not individual, but the gifts. Yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Amen. In verse 27, he says, when he says, Yea, okay, he hath said some. Okay. Uh, this is verse what? Sorry. Verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Okay. He is not discussing an individual. That is not a personal pronoun. Okay. But the bodies, uh, sorry, the body of Christ, members in particular, in function. In function, not individual people. Because that would seem to imply that there are some people of the church who are told to do some things and others are not told to do some things. If you study through what the scriptures teach, that is not really true. Yes, there are different assignments. I agree. But when it comes to general things given to us by the Spirit, what is in the Spirit is general. It's given to all, remember? He gives severally. It's in the spirit. For you to say that I don't have this particular gift, it means that the spirit of God did not come in you fully. And remember, we know from the scriptures that he gives the spirit without measure to him that he sent. So you don't have a spirit with measure which has some gifts and not others. Hallelujah. So when he says he had set some in verse 28, uh, that word is tithemi for hath set, tithemi, T-I-T-H-E-M-I. It refers to what has been fixed or done. And what has been fixed? What has been fixed or done can only be the individual gifts, not the individual members. You see how it makes sense? It can be the individual gifts, not the people. Otherwise, some people would be said eternally that this one is apostle, you are not, this one is prophet, you are not. No, that's not what is being discussed. He wasn't restricting individuals. So when we say all apostles, do we mean individuals or gifts? We mean gifts. All pastors, individuals or gifts, we mean gifts. So you covet honestly. The best gifts. Yet I show you a more excellent way. Amen. Let me quickly go through Ephesians chapter 4. Sometimes it feels incomplete to just do this part and not do Ephesians. And then we will close. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. He says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. He gave some. Now some in our English today, it means a part. It is usually uh, a numerical. So give me some bread. He's taking part of the bread. But some in the Greek here is the word tuus. T-O-U-S. And tuos speaks of a particular thing. A particular thing. So we are speaking about specificity and not quantity. So, when you say it's some apostles, we're speaking about a specific gift, apostles, a specific gift, prophet, a specific gift, uh, evangelist, a specific gift, pastoring teachers. Specific. Again, let me read it for you in the Greek, how it appears in the original. It is tus men apostolos, tus de prophetis, Tuesday wagelistas, Tuesday oimenas kai didaskalos. Oimenas kai didaskalos. 
I will expand that another time. But you see what he's talking about. So we have, uh, we have specific gift, pastor, specific gift, apostle, specific gift, evangelist, specific gift, pastor and teacher. Again, he's not referring to individuals, but gifts that differ. Hallelujah. So when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're having a discussion of a distinction of the gifts in the spirit. Paul is trying to give the church at Corinth an understanding to the end that there'll be better place to edify. To the end that there'll be better place to minister to one another, to contribute, to add. And this ties into what we discussed last week. And one thing we must know, that the gifts of the spirit are gifts in the spirit. And if they are gifts in the spirit, they are gifts in my spirit. So what do I do? I desire. How do I desire? I become active. I covet honestly the best gifts. I become active with it. There are activities you can do to become active, to desire the gifts of the spirit. Amen. So say I have tongues. I have interpretation of tongues. I have gifts of prophecy. I have gifts of word of knowledge. I have gifts of one of wisdom. I have gifts of discerning of spirit, working of miracles, healing, discerning of spirits. They are all for me. They are all in me. And they all operate in and through me. So from today onwards, I'm going to edify others. To, from today onwards, I'm going to profit other believers because these are my endowments. This is my nature. This is who I am. And I don't walk in ignorance. I now have light. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this understanding. I pray, Lord, and I believe that even as I finish teaching on this, that these gifts will even find more and greater expression in the saints. They will go after them. They will covert them. They will, they will find expression in them and through them. And they will edify others in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much for tuning in this week. Thank you, thank you very much. I believe you've been edified. Tune in again next week with someone. And remember, Jesus is Lord. You are blessed.